pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Mission statement for the Danvers Public Schools. The Danvers Public Schools is a dynamic community of independent learners dedicated to respect, responsibility, creativity, and the pursuit of academic and personal excellence. We have thousands of people here tonight. <laughs> Let's see if they're all here at the end. No. Uh, all right, so um, items of interest. We're going to start with Paul Pollock. I'm going to get you right up there. <laughs> 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 and while this isn't the subject of Paul's discussion, today, I will say that at lunch last Tuesday he did pr correctly predict the Patriots' victory yesterday. So. <laughs> I also thought Indianapolis would be Kansas City. I I wasn't going to tell him that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I have to be honest. I didn't have any money on this one, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I just love coming here. Every year I come once a year to talk about the Martin, Le Martin Luther King celebration this coming a week from today. And I get to see this. This is fabulous, believe me. I'd like to welcome you to, uh, uh, welcome you so that you might consider coming on next Monday to the high school for the annual Martin Luther King celebration. Formerly, it's put on by the Diversity Committee. Formerly, well, formerly Diversity Committee. It's the Committee for human rights and inclusion. This is a family event. It starts at 4 o'clock sharp in the atrium, goes till 6. First half an hour to 35 minutes, this is a social gathering with hors d'oeuvres and light refreshments, then followed by participation from students, K through 12. There's art, there's music, and then we have some controlled speeches. We we have this year we have Reverend uh, no excuse me Rabbi Allison Adler from Beverly who will speak for um, a short period of time. But it's an event that we think has changed dramatically over the last five years. In that it's become a family event. Bring your children, stay for as long as you like, listen to who you want to listen to, and when it's six o'clock, I guarantee you you'll be out the door. <laughs> and if you want to go home and have dinner, then you can do that too. But it's a wonderful event. We have singing groups from high school, from the uh, Unitarian Church and St. John's Prep, in addition to some student participation and a lot of amazing artwork. You should come by, and if your children have taken part in anything, I believe it's from K to... Eight. Eight. K to eight. Uh, there was just a showing last... Tuesday at the Selectman's meeting, uh, middle school presentation, I believe it was, it's fabulous, fabulous artwork. And if your child is in grades K through 8, and you should come by and see it and take part in this program. It's a lot of fun. It's an easygoing type of event, and um, I don't guarantee you won't be bored. Thank you for having me, and congratulations to all the students who participated in this event. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And now items of interest for the superintendent. One prior to that, I believe, our students. Do I have that on the agenda? Did I? Okay. Can we from the student representatives? Okay. Oh, number three. Yeah. No, first we do items of interest for us. Oh, <laughs> items of interest from us, yes. I also have, <laughs> thank you, information. Um, I am all set this evening. Thank you on that part. Anybody on the, on the committee? All set. Anybody in the audience? Right, now we can go to the students. There we go. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, so we're going to start off at Great Oak School. Um, the morning announcements at Great Oak have a new element, a mindful minute. We are using exercises from the book called Breathe Like a Bear. We end our morning announcement with these breathing exercises, and teachers and students are reporting that it is a calming way to start the learning day. Second graders are being introduced to Google Slides as another way to share their ideas in writing and social studies. Students explain their learning through a combination of writing, drawing, and technology. At Highling. Highlands, following a professional development for grades three through five, teachers at last week's early release day, the third grade students were using their Chromebooks to complete their Words Their Way word sorts. 
Students were engaged in their sorts and able to use the available technology to complete their word study. At their PLC meeting this Wednesday, their three specialist teachers, art, music, and PE, will be sharing examples of social-emotional lessons that they have been implementing in grades K through 5, while classroom teachers are participating in the FAR cycle work. These lessons last approximately 30 minutes, and staff will have a chance to participate in one of these lessons during the live demonstration on Wednesday. At Riverside, fifth graders have been learning about journalism during their writing time. Students were able to select a variety of staff to interview, such as Ms. Silva, Ms. McRae, and Ms. Powers. Journalism skills, such as asking thought-provoking questions, note-taking, and close listening were utilized and practiced by students. While staff shared important current events and specific personal experiences, this unit, along with the reading unit, consists with social studies standards of the 13 colony. At Smith, at the end of their fiction unit, Students participated in a project-based le learning experience that focused on choosing a character that deserves to be featured in Time magazine. Students were given a learn learning contract, or menu, which listed the successful criteria and choices for the project. Students drafted, peer edited, revised, and published their articles. As a class, we created an issue of Time magazine's most influential characters. They also said, today, that 10 staff members participated in a webinar with the Zones of Regulation. The focus of the webinar was to provide an overview of the program, which is designed to foster self-regulation and emotional control. A number of classrooms at Smith are currently util utilizing this curriculum, and our goal is to extend our work with the Zones by making it a universal Tier 2 intervention. During their social-emotional learning block, Thorpe's kindergarten students participate in friendship meetings. The lessons are based on the Open Circle curriculum and the Always Anti-Bullying program. Most recently, the students engaged in learning about what, what they have in common and how to give a compliment. The first graders at Thorpe have also recently become experts on penguins, based on the nonfiction reading unit they were engaged with during reading workshop in conjunction with writing teacher books during writing workshop. At the end of these units, they celebrated their learning by sharing what they learned with the kindergarten students. They drew penguin headbands, dressed in gray and black, and paraded through the K classrooms as they read their book to the students. Holton Richmond students um, recently participated in the annual Hoops for Troops competition. This three-on-three -three tournament raises funds for the Operation Troop Support. After returning from a break, the entire school continued to work on the Kindness Rocks campaign. Students painted and added kindness quotes to their rocks, which will be distributed later in the year. Officer Kalella has begun teaching the D.A.R.E. curriculum. This program is a prevention program that teaches students positive ways to say no to drug and violence. It is a partnership between the Danvers Police Department, business and community leaders, parents and teachers who work together to help children deal with the pressures and influences that promote drug abuse and violence. The D.A.R.E. curriculum focuses on teaching life skills such as dealing with peer pressure, bullying, managing stress, developing developing problem-solving skills, and building self-esteem. HRMS has also started a history club. Students will be exploring topics such as World War II and are enjoying playing the classic board game Risk. Grade 8 students just completed their unit on the Middle Ages and medieval history. Grade 7 World Geography students are creating podcasts about the Amazon rainforest. The podcast will be evaluated by students, and the top selections will be submitted to the National Public Radio Student Podcast Con contest. Grade seven, a grade seven small group math completed a baking project in which students worked together to select a recipe to bake, use mathematics to increase the recipe, and distribute the finished product to the members of the HRMS community. Students practice their mathematical skills as well as their collaborative and interpersonal skills. And here at Danvers High School, um, congratulations to the almost 200 DECA students who presented earlier this month at the district competition at Merrimack College. DHS had a fantastic showing with over 125 students moving on to the DECA state competition, including a multitude of first place finishes. DECA is an excellent example of student-led student, student project-based learning that happens every day here at Danvers High School. Um, broadcast journalism is off to a great start in its first year. Students have designed and created multiple episodes of the Falcons News Network that has been broadcast to the entire DHS community. We are excited to continue to strengthen existing courses like broadcast journalism and continue to add new interdisciplinary courses at Danvers High School. All right, thank you guys. Thank you.
guys could kind of do broadcast journalism. Are they good? They're like so good. I love broadcast journalism. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> and they have a video for us for the Martin Luther King event also yes. that we're going to oh, good. be seeing good. on Monday. Thank That's you. That's great. All right. Uh, information from the superintendent. Thank you. I would like to welcome um, our sixth graders who are part of this year's um, Town of Damas DPW calendar. And to have um, Mrs. Anna Bond come up. I believe that Gail Bernard was unable to come this evening. So Anna, um, our one of our middle school art teachers, and Mr. Federico are going to give out the certificates. On behalf of the DPW and Holston Richmond Art Department, I want to thank the school committee for allowing us to honor the annual calendar contest winners. Gail Bernardi from the DPW has been running the program and she was unable to attend tonight. Um, she really wanted to see you, so she might be stopping by our school later to also congratulate you again in person. Each year, the Danvers Department of Public Works creates the opportunity for middle school students to help raise public awareness of an important town initiative. This year, the focus was water conservation. Each sixth grade student designed and illustrated a colorful artwork based on one of the many facets of conservation. The themes included avoiding storm drain pollution, use a rain barrel, planting rain gardens, and using car wash facilities that recycle water instead of wasting it. Please help me congr congratulate the following 14 artists. For the month of January, Ella Ozzie Waters. <laughs> Each student's receiving a certificate, a calendar, and a prize to a local ice cream place. <laughs> <laughs> For the month of February, Camila Ferreira <laughs> Gomez. If you guys want to, if you guys want to stay up here, we'll do a group photo okay, when yeah. you're all done. If you want to come back up, there we go. No, right there. Yes. Yep. Yep. Right there. Hang out with us for a few minutes. <laughs> for the month of March. Kaylee Silva. More pictures. For the month of April, Priyani Raul. For the month of May, Shay Doherty. For the month of right June, Raina Langley. Right For the month of July, Sophie Sunidas. <laughs> For the month of August, Audrey Lapine. For the month of September, Bridget Forrest. For the month of October, Tabitha Sears. For the month of November, Erica Langlace. For the month of December, Olivia Page. For the cover art for the calendar, Brendan Gibbons. And for the social media art that will be going up on their website, Morgan Costa.
can congratulate them. Let all the parents take a couple pictures. Okay, thank you very much. We're very proud of our sixth graders and um, appreciate having Anna come in and um, be able to, Mrs. Bond, um, be able to recognize our students and thank the DPW for this collaboration. Right, we do have extra calendars right at the end and an opportunity, it is okay, we'll take a little transition time for our families and our students to be able to um, head out. Thank you very much, congratulations. This is great for sixth graders. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. I'm like, uh, for the ice cream for the, uh, for the ice cream store. Thank you. Thanks. Should these things pick up? Like, why would they? Can they hear us? I think they can. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. I know. <laughs> Woohoo! Enjoy. I'm pretty sure this is pushed to silence. I think I, I think. Thank you. Hello. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Pollock. Congratulations. Well done. Thank <laughs> 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 you. Hi, Paul. Thank you. Do, do you guys, do you guys can stay? I think so. Cynthia okay. and I want to see what's well, up. I'm like I love school committee. Okay, that's for <laughs> sheets. Oh, it's good because the teachers can have that. Oh, come on now. By the, after all the presentations we've Oh, okay. Yeah, so. Okay. I'm going to take my scarf yeah. off. Yeah, stay yeah. away. Yeah. I was like, us. oh, we will. So, I was like talking to like the wow. video guy. I was like, am I like in the shot? Can I just walk in? He's like, no, go, go, go. I was like, yeah, yeah. right. So, yeah. Good night. No. no. I don't do decaf stuff. I probably should, but <laughs> you get a lot going on. Yeah, I, <laughs> I know. I went to the middle school today to talk to them about clubs and stuff, and I was like, I didn't really realize, I guess, how much I did until I was talking about it. So I was like, oh, really oh, good. Should. Yeah. So it's, well, it's awesome when applying to college. Yeah. Oh, no, really, yeah. It looks good. Okay, thank you everyone. Next we have um, our new teacher mentoring update. This is also an annual opportunity to share the work through our mentoring program. So I would ask uh, Mrs. Wormus to introduce the team that will be presenting. Thank you. Sure, so tonight we have with us our, uh, our teacher leaders that run the mentoring program. Without them, it really, we would not have a program. So um, they've worked with Julie McDonald's in the past, but um, she's really worked to have them become more independent and have them really run this program, and they do. So I think that you're going to be impressed by the work that they are going to show you tonight that they've been doing with the mentoring program from the start of the school year when we have new teacher orientation all the way through um, the present time and then tell you about what else they have on the docket for the rest of the school year. So I'm going to call up uh, Cindy Grady <laughs> from Smith School, Mary Franz from the Holton Richmond Middle School, and um, David Buckoff from the high school. On behalf of Mary Franz, Cindy Grady, I would like to thank you again for inviting us uh, to speak with you. And yet again, we have the great pleasure of, of following the, the calendar. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing and it's, it's great how just everybody just leaves us like they're running away from our presentation, but I know they're not. <laughs> um, I would like everyone just to take a moment and think and reflect upon a person who has served as a mentor. If you are like me, um, I'm sure that you came to that name fairly quickly and that you have a sense of sincere gratitude. Um, the power of mentoring is driven by what we, what we refer to as the wheel of support. Our goal tonight is to provide an overview of the induction program, also known as OTAGS. It goes by various names. Um, and to highlight individuals and groups of individuals that provide crucial, uh, these individuals within the Danvers Public School community that provide crucial layers of support for our teachers. 
Um, as you can tell from, from the PowerPoint, the, our planning begins, begins in June. Uh, it's in probably right around June 10th, June 15th, that yearly we get together, uh, Cindy, Mary, and I, and we, uh, we strategize. We look at data. We look at a series of, um, uh, a series of reports from our, from our mentees. Um, and we try to identify what went well and, and what can be improved. Um, on that day, we, we also have a lot of correspondence with someone who I believe is one of our most valuable players on the OTAGS team, Patty McGinley, who um, works with us through a series of dates. We try to put together our schedule. She coordinates all the materials for the program for orientation. And um, she helps to coordinate uh, website updates, which, you know, which would, would talk about our, our, uh, our meeting times and our topics and, and, and the like. The last thing we do in, that, in, that, in those June days is we try to figure out the most pressing needs of our incoming new teachers. Uh, it is, it's our goal to um, differentiate and try to meet them where they are and what they need. Um, we also try to choose presenters that will also speak to their needs um, the OTAGS crew, we have a, a smaller part of the orientation in August. Um, we're responsible for, um, we, uh, we're in charge of uh, going on the bus ride. We're not responsible for the bus ride, but we go on the <laughs> bus ride, and it's a really great bus ride that the new teachers take uh, around, around Danvers, and they get to visit the different schools. We do run an, an hour mentor. We meet with the mentors for an hour, and we do a training. But more importantly, uh, what, start, what happens on that first day is we start to, to build the relationship between the, the new teacher and, and the mentor. And that's going to be a, a relationship that is, is going to be, it's going to be, be very important. It's going to be the, one, of, one of the first um, uh, points of, of support for our new teachers. Uh, we will also spend a brief time, along with a, a whole cadre of other people, introducing ourselves to the new teachers. And as you can see, um, our wheel of support starts to build. Our wheel of support is the Danvers Public School community. And on the, the first days of, of August, you start to see that the support network builds. Uh, it starts with the mentors and the mentees, and also the OTAGS team who uh, tries to meet their needs. Uh, off we go to se the September meeting. Uh, on the September meeting, we are, uh, we're happy and, and lucky to have Patty McGinley and Janelle Glass come and give our, our new teachers sort of the nitty gritty, the ins and outs of a lot of the technical things that they need to know, ranging from, um, ranging from um, my learning plan and, uh, and, and the system for calling for subs, just a whole litany of things that they need to know. But you can also see that another thing that we focus on in that first meeting is, um, is another layer of support where we were lucky this year to, um, to have uh, uh, Bryn Gugerich, uh and Anna Corbett and Josh Jordan come and talk to our new teachers about issues of, around special education. Uh, it's a really important thing that, that we felt that, we need, that they needed to have right from the get-go. Um, and also looking at the population of our new teachers this year, there was a, a lot of, of special ed teachers, and we felt we needed to meet them where they were. Um, and alas, uh, we, are luck we were lucky to add in early September uh, further layers to our wheel of support, which would include central office and, and special education. Thank you, David. In October, we continue to build a relationship between the mentors and the mentees by first debriefing about a skillful classroom. And we unpacked the um, unannounced observation checklist and what it looks like in their learning communities. And we also identified their supervisor, their evaluator, as another support system on this wheel of support that we're building throughout the year. So in our, in our October meeting, we did have conversations about what a skillful classroom looks like. And then the second half of the meeting, we invited Christine Purcell, a guidance counselor from the middle school, to come and join us and talk about the Alveus anti-bullying program.
So we've added them to our will of support as well, the guidance department, and um, of course our evaluators. Here are just some photographs of mentors and mentees talking about the, un, the unannounced observation checklist, asking each other clarifying questions, sharing experiences. More time that the mentors and mentees are talking during that time, different levels at the elementary, middle school, and high school, and also sharing with each other what it looks like at the elementary high school, or the elementary school and the high school. And then here's Christine Purcell. Again, really answering authentic questions about the anti-bullying program, what it looks like in your classroom, your grade level, and asking thoughtful questions, responding to each other, and sharing ideas as well. In our November meeting, the relationship continues to grow, and the mentors discussed successes and challenges. In this particular meeting, we broke out into groups, so mentors met and mentees met. And during this time, the mentors shared successes of their mentees, and we just have a few examples to share with you. One mentor wrote about um, her mentee, my mentee has maintained a positive attitude and a positive outlook since the beginning of the year. She is not afraid to reach out and ask for help or to clarify questions. That's really a growth mindset. Another mentor wrote about her mentee, that her mentee, um, in a few short weeks, has transformed her learning space into a vibrant, rich, positive, and engaging place for learning and bonding with her students. This is reflective of her enthusiasm and commitment to her students and our school. And then one more um, example to share with you. My mentee is an accomplished, confident educator. She has brought new teaching ideas and resources to our PLC. She gets our school and the people in it. And she also suggests perhaps she could have been a 0.5 mentee, meaning this mentee probably doesn't have to come to all these meetings. But so many people share so many wonderful ideas that we all continue to grow together and that trusting relationship builds. Then we were very fortunate to have another guest speaker join us in the November meeting, Mary Wormers. <laughs> and Mary, um, you can actually go ahead. Yep. Mary Wormers helped our mentees understand once again the, um, the checklist, the portfolio that will be put together for the binder, and she was able to answer questions of our teachers new to Danvers to really clarify the expectations, collect your evidence, and what it, the teaching looks like in your learning community. So again, the conversation was very rich and vibrant, and those trusting relationships are just getting strengthened throughout each month. So we added Mary Wormers to our wheel of, our wheel of support as well. Thanks, Cindy. Um, so the next phase is we call it spring ahead because this is from now until June. Um, in this time, our conversations monthly really are organic. Like we see the needs that pop up every month and we kind of plan around them. There are some themes that we tend to revisit because they're just so powerful and we know the need for them. Um, so some of the things we do revisit every year uh, beyond what comes up organically is we talk with our mentors and mentees about listening, the power of listening fully and actively in conversation. Um, that's actually what we talked about today in our meeting. We uh, also talk about the phases of first year teaching, kind of the highs and the lows that all first year teachers and teachers in general experience throughout the year and that it's okay and, and that we have some highs and lows and some middle grounds, but it feels good that many people share them. Um, we talk about the power of the work-life balance that we all kind of have um, and, and struggle with at times and the importance of taking care of ourselves because if we can take care of ourselves, that means we can take care of others. And we usually have Mary come back in, Mary Wormers come back in for like a step two, a part two of her workshop where she, we really can look at some of the evidence that teachers want to provide um, to their supervisors and build their portfolio stronger. And then finally, we end with celebration and reflection. Um, by the time June comes around, uh, the first-year teachers have gone through a long process, and the mentors as well, and, and we, we take the time to really think about that process and reflect on it and celebrate it. 
Um, beyond our monthly meetings, just very quickly, there are other things that go on too besides the meeting of the mentors and mentees monthly. We ask that mentors and mentees re meet regularly outside of our meetings. Um, mentors are also required to log their meeting dates and times on my learning plan. And we ask mentors to observe their mentees twice a year in a non-evaluative way, but just as a way of giving strong feedback to what mentees really feel like they need. And then um, another thing we've stressed is that mentees go in and observe two classes of somebody in the school or somebody in the district they feel like they really want to see. There's so much value in seeing other people teach, and um, we really stress that that's an important thing for a mentee to do. And just some pictures of mentors and me mentees meeting in their outside time. We ask mentors usually to go into a mentee's classroom and um, sit in their space and kind of become a part of their world so they feel important. <coughs> And as you can see, kind of the wheel here comes full circle. Um, we add multiple layers of the wheel. Um, we've tried, we represent as many people as we can in the community. And by the time June comes around, really, hopefully the mentees feel supported in many aspects of their life here in Danvers. Um, and that they know they can reach out to so many people um, to help get them through and continue on successfully. As um, David mentioned at the very beginning, though, at least in our wheelhouse here, the cornerstone of this wheel, if you will, we feel is that mentor-mentee relationship and that, that person that you can kind of go to that is your trusted source. Um, that really, to us, is so powerful. And so uh, we just wanted to end tonight with a letter that a mentor wrote to a future mentor. So in, in, in um, April, we asked mentors to write a letter to the future mentors coming in the following year. And they can sum it up much better than I can. So let me just read this letter to you. Dear future mentor, you are about to embark on a journey with your mentee of ups and downs, highs and lows, successes, and, well, not always successes. If things go well, hopefully you will both come out of this with a better understanding of how to reach your students and a renewed passion for teaching. Be a good listener, a cheerleader, a calming force. Be open, honest, and vulnerable. We can meet, debate, and discuss, but perhaps the best thing we can do is model our love for teaching, our love for our students, and our desire to become a better teacher every year. You will both benefit from this relationship. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. Uh, does anybody have any comments or questions? Mary Beth? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'd just like to applaud you all for working on this um, and thank you for um, everything that you do for the in, you know new teachers, for our current teachers. Um, I think this is a great program that we offer here in Danvers and I hope to see it continue. And um, just thank you so much for the extra work and effort that goes into all of this and thank all the teachers for participating with it, all the mentors and, and the mentees too. So thank you. Um, there's almost too much good stuff to say about this program. I think, Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, but when NEASC came and accredited the high school a couple of years ago, I think that they talked about our mentoring program being a model for other systems. And uh, that's high praise, but I think it's well-deserved praise. Um, it is clear that both the mentors and the mentees and the system, the district, have a real commitment to what you're doing. That last letter from the past mentor to a future mentor sort of lays that out. Um, the fact that you try and anticipate the needs of an incoming class of teachers, which may differ from year to year depending on the experience level. The fact that you realize that special education challenges um, are growing, especially from the standpoint of behavioral issues that we're seeing earlier and earlier. Um, this is really, it's a thoughtful program. You know, it's not just let's have a mentor program and then we can say we check this off. What you're doing is really helping to create that next generation of great teachers. And I'd like to think you're also forming connections to this district where teachers coming in understand that they're valued and uh, because they are. And helping them to develop helps the district. I'm sure you learn as much as you share. Uh, it's probably a wonderful experience on uh, both ends. I thank you very much for it because I believe it's a wonderful program. Thank you. Hey, 
I don't think I can say it better than that. So thank you, Eric. And thank you for your leadership. It's nice to have that consistent leadership year after year running this program. So thank you. Yep. Um, does every new hire have a mentor? Are they automatically assigned one? And do you keep that same mentor through your career um, here in the school district? Or do you get new mentors? Not officially. build the relationship and hopefully it, it continues, but it's not necessarily someone who's assigned gotcha. after year one. And then what's the typical time commitment for a mentor? Um, um, well, it's, it's once a month. Um, it's an hour at that meeting when we meet formally. Mm -hmm. And then outside of that, it's, you know, the regular meeting times. Um, it, it, once a cycle, once every seven days or so, you meet with your mentee. Um, and then it's also the logging of the time, and it's also um, the obser uh, observations as well. And it's also like coordinating. So obviously we don't know all the answers as mentors, so a lot of times we kind of, part of our job is to help make those connections, so reaching out to other people to help your mentee out as well. So it, it's a pretty big co time commitment. Yeah, that's what I was thinking when I, when I heard you talking about it. So I, I just want to thank you for that as well, because I'm sure that's a lot of time. You could be you know, doing a lot of other sorts of things, but that is a, a big, big commitment. So thank you for doing that as well. Yeah, I will echo that. The mentors put in a lot of work, and they, they really work hard for their mentees. They really do. Great. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, I, like Dave, I agree with what Eric said. So, uh, <laughs> so thanks, guys. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Next, we have an update on our strategic plan. So we came in the um, August, September timeframe with our um, strategic plan for 2018 to 2023. Um, after we completed our visioning process the year before, so we were finishing up a strategic plan. So I'd like to ask Mary Wormers, um, again, with a team that has been participating in our Essex County Learning Community Grant and um, talk about um, what are our next steps. Great, thanks. I'm really excited tonight to um, have uh, our team of uh, teachers that have helped us out with the um, strategic plan. I, it's titled Driving the Strategic Plan Forward. This group of uh, 16 uh, teachers and administrators have really worked hard to kind of take the three focal areas that we have in the uh, strategic plan and create an action plan for the five years that we have that strategic plan. So they're here tonight to kind of give you a little highlight of their work. Um, before we do that, um, this slide kind of gives you a picture of the work that we've done. I've uh, presented to you over a few months and talked about this work and, and told you about the different teams that the grant um, has, uh, has involved. Again, just to remind you, the grant has uh, six communities in it. It's our community along with Rockport, Gloucester, Swampscott, Beverly, and Haverhill. So we all meet together. Um, leadership teams and the three topical teams. So we're together with teachers from different districts, kind of sharing our understandings of each one of these areas, sharing what we're doing in Danvers, hearing what they're doing in their districts and kind of learning from one another and kind of tackling some really difficult um, pro, you know, issues that we face in education. So it's been an, an excellent opportunity to, to share in area communities and learn from them. The uh, first team that we have is the leadership team. So we're the team that kind of pulls um, all the work together. It kind of coordinates that. We uh, work. To, um, we work in each. We learn about each one of these areas of the topical teams, and we really work to to take the information that the topical teams gave us and put it into an action plan and work with them to uh, refine the action plan that we've uh, put together for the next five years. So on that team. Um, I've listed the teachers, and I'm going to introduce them as they come up and do the, in the presentation. We had three topical teams. They call these the research teams, and uh, these teams got uh, really dove into some areas. And the first one is the social emotional learning or SEL topical team. So they worked um, with a expert in that area and met monthly to um, do new learning and social emotional learning. Second group is the tier one topical uh, the. Tier one academic topical team, and they really dove into tier one academics and really learning about RTI systems or multi tiered systems of support, how some districts are doing it, what the best practices were. 
And then finally, the uh, third group uh, was the cultural proficiency topical group, and uh, they really worked on uh, issues of cultural proficiency and um, of students and teachers. So they'll be, each one of these groups will be up in a minute to um, talk to you about what they learned. So starting this work out, we're going to have the, our uh, leadership team come and kind of give you an overview of the work we did. Um, on that team is Bria Plummer, Caitlin Resnick, Mary Franz, Josh Jordan, those are, that's our teacher representatives. And then for administrators was Mary Tatum, Adam Federico, and myself. So, I gotta come up. And in this grant, they asked us um, to, to identify some uh, ch priority challenge areas that the district is focused on, and then kind of set some goals for that. And so we have the team starting out. Hey, I'm back. <laughs> um, so uh, the heart of our work began with the district's vision statement. Keeping a focus on the five-year strategic plan, the ECLC grant helped us form groups which tapped into many stakeholders and form a collaborative effort towards developing coherent action plans. It is anticipated these plans will move our community forward, particularly in the areas of multi-tiered levels of support and social-emotional learning. So in our work, the following challenges and objectives became clear. So first we have our priority challenge number one. This is improving academic achievement through a collaborative approach to servicing students with diverse learning needs. And our goal is to refine the district's multi-tiered system of support model to ensure that inclusive, culturally responsive interventions are implemented so that all students have access to the grade level curriculum. So there are two main object objectives for this goal. The first is to use an assessment system that incorporates both formative and summative assessments to enhance student achievement. And this aligns nicely with our FAR cycle work that we've been doing for the past year and a half. Our second objective is to define and implement a multi-tiered system of support, MTSS, which you'll hear a little bit more about from our topical team group. Our second priority challenge um, is that a number of students in the district have a range of challenging behaviors, and we seek to increase the flexibility in the way that we deal with and educate students with challenging behaviors in the classroom. Our goal is to plan for and implement the five social emotional learning competencies across the district in a coherent manner, and the objective for the goal is to develop a tiered system to support student social emotional learning that's collaborative and flexible. Good. So we have this graphic for you to kind of show you that we're really looking to develop two um, multi-tiered systems of supports, one that really clearly defines our academic side of uh, the interventions that we're going to be taking, and then also one that works on the social-emotional or the behavior side. Um, so that is a, a major goal for the district um, as we move forward, and you'll hear that from the topical teams. So our first topical team is going to talk to us um, about... Um, Tier one academics. So on that team, we have um, Kathy Carey, uh, Tanea St. Pierre, Christina Beecher, and Will Ford. And as you can tell, you can see this representatives from the elementary, middle, and high school at each one of these teams. Hi. So I just want to explain to you first what the multi tiered support system looks like. You may know it more as RTI, response to intervention. But in our understanding through the readings and discussions that we had as part of the um, academic topical team, it's our understanding that this is a more better defined and comprehensive support system for students. Um, it's important to remember that all three tiers of this support system are general education supports, meaning that they are provided by all general education staff. I'm going to speak directly to the Tier 1 support. This is um, students within the classroom at the elementary level and in the content areas at the secondary level are identified by their teacher as um, demonstrating difficulty either in understanding the concept or in their performance related to the concept. Those students are identified they are brought into small group within the classroom, and they're provided with additional instruction by the classroom or content area teacher. 
The intervention should last for at least four weeks. In that time, formative assessments are taken. Those formative assessments help to guide the teacher's instruction, whether they need to target a specific component to clarify that and move the student forward, or some of those formative assessments, especially when you get toward the end of the four-week intervention, will also dictate what further interventions need to happen. So if you look at the visual that is behind you or on your screens, you can see that it's clearly a tiered system. Tier one would be the green component, which is the most basic level of intervention, with the goal being that it is inclusive because it happens within the general education classroom and that we're meeting each student at where their performance level is and moving them forward so that they're able to meet the grade level expectations. And as you follow the pyramid up to tier two and tier three levels of support, it is important to note that the intensity of the intervention, the frequency of the intervention is going to increase, as well as the amount of progress monitoring that the teacher is doing. Additionally, the group size will decrease as you move up to tier two and tier three levels of support. Um, it's important that in all levels of support, teachers are implementing effective research-based interventions while using, such as Kathy said, using the frequent formative assessments so that the adjustments can be made as needed, constantly using that data to inform your instruction. As a topical team, we discussed that the Tier 2 interventions may be implemented by a classroom teacher if time allows, or by a specialist, such as a reading specialist, a Title I teacher, or any other specialist. We discussed that often the Tier 3 support will typically be provided by a specialist due to the nature that it is the most intense intervention, often consisting of a one-on-one -on -one or a one-on-two setting. Classroom teachers may face more challenges trying to implement an intervention of this intensity just due to the time constraints. We also discussed, as Kathy mentioned, that this multi-tiered system of support does consist of these regular education interventions um, trying to target the goal of de decreasing the number of students who are brought forward for a core evaluation. Uh, <clears throat> here we've identified what we believe are the strongest benefits um, to using MTSS and also um, some possible next steps. <clears throat> so based on our work, um, we believe that MTSS allows students, our teachers, to identify both uh, students' needs and strengths. Um, the data used will drive future instruction when addressing the whole class and also um, targeting students that are at risk as well. Um, it also allows for targeted instruction um, in measurable interventions for at-risk students and um, will help potentially close the gap for those at-risk at -risk students as well. Uh, therefore, decreasing the number of students recommended for core evaluations. So like with the adoption of any new protocol, it's important to also look ahead and anticipate what are some of the um, different steps that we need to take in order to make this successful within the Danvers Public Schools. So one of the things we are realizing in talking with other school districts as well is that we might need to be flexible in our scheduling, particularly for the secondary level. We currently have a system where we each content teacher meets with the students about 51 minutes a class period. So this might need to uh, be looked into in terms of are there other options that we could schedule that might allow for teachers to meet with these students, particularly the ones who need a little bit of more support um, with extended time as they're only given that extra 75 minutes one day in a seven day rotation. Uh, some other things we are anticipating too uh, is time to analyze data and complete action steps. This is actually already happening uh, with the far cycle in our district, which has been a great advantage this year. But we want to make sure that that is continues to happen and it happens in an equitable way for teachers at all levels. In addition, um, with creating a new protocol for collecting data, it's important to make sure that you're create, uh, collecting data in a targeted way. So we want to make sure that teachers go into the year knowing specifically whether there's going to be a goal for the course level or a goal for their content that they're teaching. So that way they don't experience data fatigue by in, in, uh, collecting data from all areas. A couple other things, we want to make sure that professional development continues to be uh, provided for teachers for support, especially teachers beyond our uh, group who have been studying this for the past six or seven months. 
Um, and lastly, it's important to shape our district mindset in a positive way. We have had the pleasure and the opportunity to research this alongside six other districts, and we want to make sure that we are continuing to shape our district mindset in a positive way around adopting this new protocol. Okay. So that was our um, Tier 1 Academics Topical Group. I didn't know if you had any questions before they sat down, or do you want to just keep going on? Yeah, okay, yeah, great. great. All right, so our next topical group is our Social Emotional Learning uh, Topical Group. We have uh, Cindy Grady um, for the elementary level, Jeff Bartlett for the Holt Richmond Middle School, and Alex Grover for Danvers High. So in front of you, in front of you, you'll see a definition of social emotional learning. It's very much a buzz phrase in education these days. Uh, it's from Castle, which is the collaborative for academic social and emotional learning. As an aside, they are hosting the first social emotional learning conference in Chicago in October, just in case there's any extra funding. <laughs> um, so SEL is a process. So it's a process that involves children and adults. So we're not just talking about students here. We're talking about any adult who works within Danvers Public Schools where they can acquire and then apply knowledge, attitudes, and skills that are necessary to understand and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, and also make responsible decisions. So it's not just about knowing things, it's about doing things, it's about applying in everything we do, uh, things that can help us identify emotions, make better decisions, and really just everything that we want our students and adults to be able to do at all times during the school day. So part of social emotional learning is looking at the five competencies, as you can see on the wheel. And one of the first competencies there is the self-awareness, that you know your emotions, you know your feelings, you know what you're thinking. And then the self-management, you're able to regulate yourself in any context, in any situation, given the feelings that are either overwhelming you or how you're feeling, but you're really able to self-manage it. And then you're socially aware of the people around you, again, the context that you're in, and being able to regulate yourself. From there, you can build relationships. So relationship skills are part of these five competencies. And then responsible decision-making, where you're able to make constructive choices based on your personal behavior and your social interactions. And you can see the rims around the wheel include the classrooms, the schools, and the community as a whole. So these five social competencies really help drive the social emotional learning and the standards that will be expected of all of us in our learning community. So the big question is what's next? What does this look like? And how will Danvers um, learning communities continue to grow with SEL? And we frame it like this because there's already so many great things happening in the Danvers public schools and great interactions between staff members and students um, in our buildings. Um, but teachers all intuitively have, and staff members that are in schools intuitively have the capacity um, to have empathy and to pod positively interact with students. So what this initiative is about is about putting that at the forefront and having a common language between all staff members um, with a focus on these positive interactions and integrating the competencies that uh, Cindy just laid out um, everywhere within our buildings. So classrooms, hallways, cafeterias, bus rides, activities, school functions and events, and administrative meetings like this one. Um, one of the things that sticks out to me from our training with the Essex County Learning Community is that one of our sessions, um, we were talking about this work that went on in Austin, Texas um, a few years ago, and they said that a training went on for school committee members in social emotional learning. So it was from the top down and everybody was involved with this initiative, teachers, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, administrators, uh, and people like you guys, so. That's great, thanks. And our final team is uh, the cultural proficiency topical team. Um, their work isn't uh, a, a pillar in our strategic plan, but they're gonna be integrated into the, into the three areas that we have that we're focusing on. So 
Um, we have with us today uh, Juliana Robbins, Kristen Algovitz, and uh, Linda Armstrong uh, to present the work that they did. Um, so through the series of classes, we're able to understand what, um, we begin to understand what it means to be culture proficient. Um, we first had to examine what is culture and then reflect on what were our own cultures, and that's sort of how that shapes us. Um, so we were able to define culture as a system of shared beliefs, customs, behaviors, and artifacts. It is a force that shapes behaviors, values, and institutions, and is transmitted from generation to generation. So once we understood that, we started to work on what it means to be culturally proficient and how that would translate to interactions within the school community. Um, so cultural proficiency is knowledge-based skills and understandings that are required to successfully teach and interact with students. It's viewing a student's culture as an asset and not a deficit in the classroom, and it requires continuous reflection on one's own values. Um, here's a picture of the continuum of cultural proficiency. Um, culture can be a topic that people may try to avoid in conversation because it makes them feel uncomfortable. Um, however, it is important that we educate ourselves and our students to be capable of having these discussions surrounding differences in culture. What we learned in our work is that being culturally proficient isn't black and white. It is a continuous journey along the um, continuum. Um, and it's a journey within the individual addressing their biases that they may or may not know they had, which is something that we were able to do during our work. Um, the goal through personal reflection is that one reaches cultural proficiency, which in turn helps improve how we service all cultures within our school community. Um, this experience had a profound impact on me. Um, there's a lot to be taken from this experience. In moving forward, um, we know that we need to secure professionals um, educators in the field of cultural competence to provide professional development that will promote self-awareness of implicit bias, the unconscious bias that we all have that can impact our students and each other's. And as was pointed out earlier, this is a difficult conversation to have. Um, we do need the trained professionals to facilitate those conversations. We need to create a professional learning culture where teachers collaborate and assess progress towards cultural proficiency in the classroom and the school community. We need opportunities to support each other, to share, to respond appropriately and effectively to issues that arise in our growing diverse environments. Um, before I read the quote um, that we chose that we think really encapsulates our experience, um, I wanted to say that as a parent of two daughters who went to Danvers High School and went through the Danvers school system, and as an elementary school teacher here, I appreciate and value the academic learning that takes place in our schools. But for me, I think it's equally important that we preserve the dignity of individuals by moving towards greater cultural competence. So I leave you with this quote from Gary R. Howard. Beyond college, we want to prepare students for a world of many cultures and to contribute to a world in which those cultures are preserved, valued, and built upon. Thanks. So those are, those are our presentations from each of our uh, research groups and from our leadership team. And um, we are already started to put our action plan um, into, into motion. We had to present in December, early December, our action plan. And um, from there, we, we've gotten going on, on the steps. So for around so social emotional learning, we have, we're convening a district-wide steering committee to guide social emotional learning in the district. Uh, that team of 11 people will be attending a conference that we're having here in Danvers on January 28th um, with the organization SEL for Mass. Uh, we have many area school districts are coming to it. Uh, they actually are, um, we're just hosting the conference, but they are putting, um, putting it on. And so our 11, uh, team of 11 will be there at that conference. That's when we will kind of 
begin our planning for the remainder of the year, but much of that work is going to be focus group meetings, and it's going to be the, the groups that, uh, that uh, Alex was talking about. We're going to have uh, focus groups of bus drivers all the way up to hopefully you, the school committee, and uh, central office administrators. So there's, a, there's a many groups that we're going to be um, reaching out to and really getting their ideas around social-emotional learning, kind of doing a needs assessment. Tier 1 academics started back on our last uh, district-wide training for the FAR cycle. It was focused on uh, addressing Tier 1 um, instruction and how we can improve and use Tier 1 uh, instruction methods as we, um, in the what they call the firm action phase of the FAR cycle, of that taking action. So we focused in, did a lot of um, uh, learning uh, around what, what some of those instructional strategies are. Um, and uh, the grant is actually going to have an expert come, come into the, to work with the six communities around MTSS. Um, Judy Elliott's her name, and we're really looking forward to working with her. She actually gets to come to our district for a day to kind of just work on Danvers-specific uh, issues and help us move our MTSS system forward. And then finally, our cultural proficiency work is uh, we're trying to... Um, Integrate this more into uh, our PD work with teachers is really working on the mindset um, around cultural proficiency and kind of thinking more, have, having people think more about implicit biases. So that's some of the work that we look forward to in the future um, in that area. So that's our presentation, and I thank all the teachers. We could, <laughs> this has been so much work that we've gotten done, could never have gotten done in a year or two if, without them. And uh, just it's, you know, their work is invaluable to the district. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, comments or questions, Jeff? Uh, there is quite a lot here. Um, I'll just focus on two areas. One is social emotional learning. Um, do you assess students or teams on each of these areas? So, social awareness, relationship skills, is there some sort of um, evaluation you would do if, if, a, if you feel a student needs help there or is it these are just sort of best practices and we just sort of try to train students on all of them which is part of good practice we don't really assess students on this um, our hope is to have standards and for each of the social emotional uh, competencies at each of the grade levels so that we could kind of have some type of assessment of how they're doing on that so that, again, is work to come and some of the work that they did talk about in their topical team group. Um, as far as um, students in the multi-tiered system of support, I think that gets identified um, through uh, the schools. Um, you know, the social workers can identify students that might need some more help and support on learning some of the uh, needed some intense training in the five uh, competencies, really actually around two of them, right, the self-regulation. and Yeah and management, so self-awareness and self-regulation. So um, that, that is another way that we assess and that we move uh, a student maybe from the tier one that's been happening in the classroom up to a tier two um, intervention where we do more um, direct instruction. Okay, great. Yeah, before Alex sends me to a social emotional learning class, I kind of <laughs> want to just know where one might okay. stand on, on ahead of time. Uh, there you go. <laughs> I don't think you should go. I, I really, probably not. Um, <laughs> The other area was on the continuum of cultural proficiency. Is Again, is that sort of an evaluation of where we are as a district? Is it individuals? Is it, like, what, what is, and where would someone rank on this? What, what, how do we use this? Um, I would have to ask the, the group because I did, we didn't do as much work, but I think it is, like, just to be aware of where the different stages pe people will be on, uh, on the continuum, and then... Yeah, it's, it's an individual. Okay, okay. Gotcha. But it's to help us think about how do we, you know, work as we put professional development together and kind of gear some of the work that we do. It can be around that continuum. Great. Perfect. Thanks. Dave? Uh, first of all, just thank you to all the teachers and the administrators who are part of all these groups. I know it's time-consuming, and it's just really impressive to see your commitment to the district and your students and the schools. So thank you so much. Um, two questions, um, both, I guess, related, uh, different than Jefferson, related to the multi, what is, I can't read my own writing, multi-tiered systems. Um, we've talked in past meetings uh, about how teachers are breaking students down into small groups based on their 
abilities and, you know, um, you know, the different concepts that they're teaching and all of that. I'm just wondering, do we have enough time and enough support to do that? Um, I, my concern is that, you know, we're breaking down into these groups, but, you know, one teacher can only do so much, obviously. Um, and what's happening to the other students? So if you, we're working with a low tier group, for example, on a specific subject, you know, they're having trouble grasping the concept, what's happening to the bulk of those students? And then what are we doing about the students that need extension during that time yeah. so we're not losing them? Right. So that's a lot of that far cycle work that we, you've heard about and that that's what teachers are planning. So when they work collaboratively in their grade level, their common planning time teams, that is uh, some of the work that they do together. So they think about how do we work with kids that, you know, uh, experience difficulties. They, they sort kind of groups of kids and there might be one that have difficulties. They might need my attention more. I might have to do some reteaching with them. Here's some kids that have already mastered that concept. They've shown, they've demonstrated uh, understanding of it. So here's like some extension problems that they can do to extend their learning. Um, so that's with a teacher that might be in their classroom to do that work. But then also um, some, some teams have gotten together and they've split the kids up amongst three of them. So if there's three people on a common planning time team, that's a lot more difficult to do because, you know, there's a lot of timing. There's a lot of planning that goes into that. But, and you have to have... Um, it's easier maybe at the middle school level where the, in the elementary level when they are having the exact same time, the topics at the high school, the, their schedules are not always aligned where they could be splitting up and, and sharing students that way. So um, time is always going to be an issue, and that's what we're, um, we're aware of that. And that's um, in one of the slides that was Will Ford talked about was, you know, when, as we schedule, we need to be thinking about the, that kind of structure that we might need to put into the schedule to try to figure out what that is. So that's something that's ongoing and working with the teachers and then administrators trying to figure that out. Okay. Well, that's just a concern that I want to make sure that we're looking at as we're moving forward. And then also Mr. Ford brought up, uh, I loved his terminology, data fatigue. Um, I want to make sure that we're not requiring the teachers to gather so much data that they're not having the time to go to these you know, individual groups and do these yep. things because we're so busy right. gathering data. Exactly. So um, how do we, where do we stand with data fatigue? Are, you know, are we like, whoa, or are we like, okay? And, and I'm looking at a huge group and they probably don't want to say anything. Um, <laughs> no, they probably do want to say <laughs> I think that's really important yeah. to, yeah. you know, there's gotta be some balance there yeah. between gathering data, which it's really important to have local data as we've talked about because of all the, you know, changes in the state testing and all that. but to the point where its overload isn't right. going to benefit anyone. Right, right. And it's curriculum-based is the key, right? That it's, it's something that they're doing every day in their classroom is the data they're collecting. So it could be a problem that the kids are working on in the math class or it could be um, like a part of an essay that they were writing in English class that they are looking at. So that it's not, you know, something additional that they're laying on top of it, but it's something that they're, they're doing as you know, as good teaching practice that they are just in, through their teaching. I mean, exit tickets have always been a part of their teaching to make sure that as the kids are leaving the classroom, they were learning the concepts that they were they were teaching, the objectives they set for them. They were looking to see that they kids, students if they were on their way to getting to understanding what they were teaching that day. So those that would be the data that we would, that we're asking them to look at. Okay. So it's not above and beyond. Not right. No. Okay. All right. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, I uh, counted 18 different uh, individuals who were involved in these groups between administrators, teachers, specialists. And so first of all, thank you. Um, that's a lot of people devoting their time to something like this. And uh, I continue to be impressed almost every time we have a presentation with the enthusiasm that um, teachers and administrators bring to work that's outside of the, it's not just in the classroom. It's enhancing what's going on in the classrooms. Um, but I suspect that, you know, teachers like to teach and their joy is in being in front of students and, you know, helping them learn. And to take on something extra is always, I'm sure, a challenge and it's got to be something that comes from the heart. Um, my other comment really relates to the um, whole cultural proficiency piece. I think that we're sort of you've hit on kind of right where we are as a society right now. Um, things are changing. Things are becoming more diverse, and they will continue to. This is not something that's suddenly going to change. 
We're not rolling back the clock, nor should we. Um, and so to be able to develop a culture here, and I think, Jeff, when you were talking about how do you, how do you measure this, I don't know if you measure it other than recognizing as, as a district when we're moving along that continuum, when the culture of our cultural proficiency moves more and more toward a greater understanding, acceptance, recognition of cultural differences and how those enter into learning. We'll know it when we feel it, but it's really developing our culture to be one that accepts the broader cultural differences. And uh, vitally important, I think, to making sure that all our students learn today and in the future. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Mary Beth? Uh, I again want to echo what my colleagues have said. Thank you to all the teachers that are participating in this and the administrators as well. All of these topics are very important um, in the district, especially here in Danvers. Um, social emotional learning, I agree, um, Alex. Um, I think as a board we should be participating in, in the learning of this as well. Sure. I mean, I live it daily with my child, but not everyone does, and until you learning about it or you do live in it, you don't really know. So I do think that being aware of it is something that everyone should be, and I thank you again for working on this and the academics as well. I mean, you know, there is a wide range of students nowadays, and to be able to work with the students individually and know where they're at is just, it is time consuming, but it's so important. And the cultural proficiency as well, I do agree that in Danvers we do need to work on that more, but that's something that's always going to have to be worked on because it's always changing. Um, but as long as we're, it's always there and we're always working on it with, with the students and the families and the community, um, I think we, we'd be doing our jobs. So I do want to thank you all for that as well. Um, I do also, you know, a lot of these, we're, we're putting a lot of work into this. This is a lot of work. This grant is awesome, but I also think we have to be mindful of the supports that we need to be giving to continue this work can't be just something we're just doing now and then mm -hmm. then it's gone because we can't you know help support it so we have to be mindful of that um, through budget and through what is needed in the classroom so again thank everyone for their work on this participation and thank you to the administration for certainly bringing this uh, or applying for this grant and, and bringing it to Danvers so thank you okay great um, again I could repeat what everybody said but I'm not going to <laughs> uh, just thanks, uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, Mary uh, was really uh, another really, really important and well done presentation. I hope people actually. I know a lot of people don't watch Danvers Cable, but you know, <laughs> I hope they I hope they tune in and catch it a little bit here and there, because uh, a lot of times people don't know what happens in this school system. I think some of the stuff that we've seen over the last few months, including tonight, show so it's just a lot more than what people think. So, uh, thanks everybody, and uh, we'll go on to the next item. Thank you, everyone. Um, our last part of the information from the superintendent is our facilities update with Mr. Traverno. So we have two projects we want to update you on tonight. The first is the Highland School roof. So we're excited. We submitted our schematic design package to MSBA on January 2nd, um, and we'll go to their next board meeting in February, hopefully to get approval on that schematic design and um, what, the, what the rough budget is as part of that estimate to continue to progress towards replacing the roof. And then for the Smith School, um, we had our board meeting with MSBA in mid-December where we signed the project funding agreement for the project. So we locked in what our maximum grant will be for what the state's participation will be, which is a critical step with them as they review our entire package. Last week, there was a Board of Selectmen hearing for the Warren article to approve the project at Special Town Meeting in February. The board did support that um, warrant which is progressing to finance committee which is actually tomorrow night so they'll have their hearing tomorrow night and hopefully get approved there as well and then move on to a town meeting member workshop on saturday january 26th that's scheduled for 9 a.m is open to town meeting members especially who will all receive an invitation as well as any member of the public who continues to want to learn more about the project it really is an exciting project for not only um, the Smith School, but also our other elementary schools in town. The, um, last Friday, we actually had a meeting with our elementary science team to talk about STEM and STEAM space and what that would look like in the Smith School. And I think that's one of the exciting parts to me is that as the school opens, it will increase the availability of space in some of our other elementary schools as well. 
So it'll allow for all of our libraries to have a learning common section and then a makerspace or a STEM <coughs> STEAM area. So we were able to look at how we would identify our, our key aspects of a new school, but also look at how will that be applied to our other four elementary schools as we really look to roll out collaboration and STEM and STEAM and all of these ideas to all five of our elementary schools. Okay, thanks. Any questions? Everybody good? All right. New business. Okay, the first item is our MTA initiative fund um, our future, and I'd ask um, our DTA president, Mr. Farrell, to come up and um, a request that the Danvers School Committee sign a resolution to support the MTA fund our future. Welcome. Sure. All right, good evening. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, address the school committee. My name is uh, Glenn Farrell, the president of the Danvers Teachers Association. I want to start by um, thanking all the teachers who are here tonight. I'm um, supporting if you guys saw all the great signs they have. Throw them up. They're incredible. Um, hard to see, but maybe we'll leave them for you. I'll, I'll read them in a minute to you. Um, and also joined by some colleagues behind me who will speak to some specific, specific things that we want to talk about. John Hodson, Amber, Amber Adair, and Tracy Ewing. And uh, Jody, she didn't, Jody she didn't wanted to be here tonight, but um, her family needed her tonight more than we did. Um, so we are here tonight out of deep concern about the ability of Danvers Public Schools to meet the needs of all the students we educate. I want to be clear on that in no way am I uh, knocking the, the town or what the district has done so far for, for the students' needs. And uh, we fully recognize and appreciate the increases and improvements to our technology, curricula, and school buildings. Our concern stems from the fact that Danvers Public Schools, like districts across the Commonwealth, have been severely underfunded for many years. A bipartisan commission determined in 2015 that Massachusetts public schools are underfunded by $1 billion annually because of the, fun the formula used to calculate state aid to schools has not been properly revised or updated since 1993. The uh, Massachusetts Budget and Policy Center calculated what districts would receive the formula used to, to determine Chapter 70 aid to schools using the recommendations of the commission that studied school funding were brought up to date. Danvers Public Schools would receive an additional $811,900 annually if the so-called foundation budget were fully funded. Imagine what we could do if we had nearly a million more dollars each year for our budget and for our students. <clears throat> we could reduce class sizes. We could bolster social and emotional support for our students. We heard a little bit about that already. We could enhance professional development. We could make sure every classroom had sufficient supplies. We could do more for our special education learners. We could find new opportunities for our accelerated learners. We could do all of, the, all of these things and more. The legislature failed to take any action to begin the process of updating the foundation budget formula, even though various proposals to do so were under consideration during the previous legislature session. Our students can no longer wait for the public schools to be f uh, fully funded in the manner that they were intended to be when the foundation budget was created again in 1993. It was created to ensure that all students have access to the education they deserve. There is great excitement over the possibility of increasing state funding to our public schools. However, there are likely to be multiple means of doing so. What I would impress upon you tonight is to consider the method that brings more assistance to schools without any extra strings attached. There are likely to be other strategies to increasing school funding that carry additional layers of accountability. And some may say that not, they do not want to give schools a blank check. To that I would say, and I believe that my fellow teachers, administrators, students, and parents would all agree with, that there isn't really any more room in our schools for more accountability. And that schools and students in our fine commonwealth have been held accountable quite enough to have identified the need to increase school funding on the merit of improving the education for all of our public school children. That is why we're asking you to pass this resolution calling on the legislature to implement a fully funded foundation budget without strings attached by May 1st, 2019. Please join your colleagues on school committees across the state that have already passed such a resolution, 42 so far and counting. And together we can send a powerful message to Beacon Hill. Thank you. So we've identified sort of three areas where we would we feel as um, teachers that that money would be useful. So I'm I'm here to uh, talk about um, the special ed sort of aspect of that. Uh, I'm a high school special ed uh, teacher, and um, I it would be easy for me to say stuff. Um, so I, I think that stuff is very helpful to students. Technology resource, uh, you know classroom resources, that kind of thing. Um, but when really looking at this, I think the most important thing is personnel. Um, I think um, that we need um, specialists. You've heard from lots of groups today saying that we need um, uh, those specialists for the tiers. We need specialists in the classrooms. We need aides. We need um, social workers. 
Um, that is what we really need in the school in order to really support students. And that's uh, where I think this money would be the most useful. Um, along with that is um, those, those people need training. So um, we've heard uh, all of the um, groups that just presented all mention PD as, as something that is an additional next step for uh, what we need to do to make sure that, that those are implemented well in Danvers Public Schools. And so I think um, making sure that though the personnel that we do have are trained and trained well in these new initiatives. And um, I believe that that's one of the places where this money would be very useful. Good evening. I'm John Hudson. I teach sixth grade science at Holton Richard Middle School. Uh, and I want to talk about how the uh, Fund Our Futures money would benefit uh, educators in the districts who are involved in STEM education. So in 2016, there was a big shift in science and technology. Uh, Massachusetts adopted new frameworks for K through 12 students. So these standards were sort of a shift not only in what we teach, but how we teach it. Um, the focus shifted from a place where we were driven by content standards, in other words, just what the kids are learning, uh, to kind of getting them to come to a conceptual understanding and applying those concepts. Um, they also interest in, uh, integrated the science content with science practices, things like uh, learning how to make models, uh, design investigations. Uh, and this sort of reflected current thinking about the best ways to teach science uh, and technology. Um, I think this is a good shift um, because this more inquiry-based approach forces kids to think and to solve problems uh, to prepare for jobs of tomorrow. Um, as we make this shift as science teachers, though, this money would be invaluable in doing things like uh, replenishing supplies, reimbursing consumable items, and of course, again, professional development uh, to help teachers get trained to meet all these new challenges that we face. Um, as technology teachers, and speaking to our technology teachers, um, again, the technology world is changing so fast um, that the technology department you know, tries to provide a hands-on project-based learning experience. So things like our CAD program, robotics program, uh, CNC router introduces students to the 21st century skills they need to be successful. So with this extra funding, uh, have the ability to purchase extra robots, uh, provide more students the opportunity uh, to be continuously engaged with a 3D printer, uh, design students uh, to bring kind of the CAD program ideas to life. Um, math education as well as science has also shifted their approach in teaching mathematics uh, several years ago. They use again more of a problem-based uh, centered curriculum to promote uh, inquiry-based teaching and learning in their classrooms. Uh, again, like the science department, so there's been a big shift in education as we've all heard a lot about um, and making things more project-based and through this uh, teachers need training we need supplies uh, to bring the curriculum to life. Um, so as the district moves forward toward the more project-based learning curriculum to prepare Danvers students for the careers of tomorrow, uh, the Fund Our Futures money would be invaluable to Danvers students and teachers. Um, I think we all kind of want the same thing, to bring the best education uh, to teachers, and this money would be really helpful toward this goal. Thank you. I just want to kind of highlight some of the things in the the posters because they're kind of hard to tell to see there. But each of them says, I love Danvers Public Schools. And then it says, with extra funding, we could. And then people filled in different things, such as have two full-time basic skills teachers and two full-time reading teachers at all five elementary schools. We could buy leveled books for classroom libraries. We could have more social emotional training and support. We could have more special needs support and educators. We could have five elementary libraries to promote increased early academic ex excellence. And I wrote that one, but I, it's essentially, yeah, you could, yeah. And then Jay's just says we could have 800,000, 811,900. <laughs> and the, but the big thing with it is that it is that amount per year in the, in the idea of this, which I think obviously would, you know, or hopefully in perpetuity. Um, and so just across the board, obviously everybody is excited about bringing more funds into the district and then just keeping the, uh, the, the idea that there, there could be some, some uh, people in maybe the, the private sector, I think 
um, that may bring this, a similar idea to increase school funding, but with this caveat of increasing some kind of accountability measures, which I would imagine some kind of uh, testing regime, or, I don't know, change or something, which in my mind just would siphon off maybe even more money that, would, that could be going directly to the students. She was just here for months. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> she did a great job. Uh, all right, thanks, uh, Glenn and Tracy and John. Um, Lisa, from the administration standpoint, um, this is something that you think is, and, and your, your group thinks is also. And I think each of the uh, major associations for Massachusetts in education are taking um, slightly different approaches, but all with the same goal of increasing the um, funding for public education and changing the funding formula as stated from the commission a couple of years ago. So MASS has um, work that they are doing and also MASC. Okay. I think it's important to note that as we look at this too and look at the funding models to implement it, that there has been proposals to do it in four tiers and not all four of those proposal means dollars to every district depending on the way they implement it. So that there there is options where if you if they implement just option one, that it will help lead to more equity amongst all public school education students, but most of the dollars would go towards larger cities or lower economic communities first. If we get into options two through four, then the funding makes it to smaller towns and um, communities with more relative wealth as we get into those other options. Okay, which, which would not be unexpected. Uh, um, also, I just want to thank you for giving us a heads up and, and giving us lead time so we could understand what you were looking for. Sometimes there have been times where, where somebody's throwing a resolution at us and, 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 you know, it's like buying a car the second you walk on the lot. So, um, but I appreciate that. So we were able sure. to take a look at it and see it. Um, it doesn't seem too controversial to me, but I'll let uh, um, Eric, why don't you... Uh, Mr. Legislature, why don't you uh, give well, us your thoughts? <laughs> my, well, I actually uh, inquired of the uh, Representative Spiliotis today, and uh, he said, uh, <clears throat> in essence, he, he can't remember a time when there has been more, um, what's the word I'm looking for, more energy around this, more things being raised in the legislature, more people contacting legislators about this um, more lobbying going on, if you want to put it that, you know, small L lobbying to uh, make this an issue that should be discussed and perhaps acted on by the legislature. He also mentioned that he has a uh, roundtable with the superintendents coming up. Friday. He's very interested in this as a topic for that roundtable. Um, so it seems like there is, you know, a bit of a, I won't say a groundswell, but at least a more firmer discussion going on. So it's likely that you know, legislators react to what the public is looking for and talking about and what the constituents are looking for and talking about. doesn't mean you'll get everything you want, but it puts it on the table. So um, I think that this is the right time to be doing this. Um, I think procedurally, too, Mr. Chairman, yeah, and that we need an app, a resolution. If you want us to vote on a resolution, we need a resolution to vote on. So at some point you'll have to come back before us, whether it's next month or, or later. Uh, did you not receive one ahead of time? I'm sorry? Did you not receive one ahead of time? Did what? We did not receive no, a resolution, well, did we? The, there is, the link. But that's, uh, that has is, blanks in it that's not, you know, that looks like it's something that was from a different school district. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, oh, okay. unless i Is that I'm the one with the video something. in it? The empty uh, website is on the link. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. What it was we were supplied a, with was a link to a. Yeah. Oh no. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought yeah, uh, Jody shared a, a Google Doc with you. There's but, a form resolution with some, you know, basic okay. blanks in it. Yeah. Maybe she's give us something one. complete. Okay. Yeah, to enough. pass a resolution. Yeah. 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 So, um, I'm sorry. I don't know if Jody had sent that directly. Um, I, I'm not sure, but his his I, I I think I can, I think everybody's in support of this. Correct. Yeah, I just have a yeah. question. Yeah, uh, but completely. Of course, we want more money for our district, right? You know, it, I wouldn't be in this, you know, sitting in the seat if I didn't want to be supporting our schools. And money is the way we do that. But if it's eight hundred and eleven thousand dollars in Danvers, that's hundreds of millions of dollars across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Where's this money coming from? 
Are we pulling it from other budget line items or is it raining somewhere money that I'm not aware of? <laughs> I just don't. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not that something point. I you know. I don't, I don't have the direct answer to that, but I know it's in the talks, you know, again, with, with legislators, you know, this is the goal, I think, for a lot of people. So how do you do it intelligently and, right. and you know, something that makes sense for all people? What that looks like, I couldn't predict, I guess. Because we all have about. budget restrictions we have to live in. You know, every year as we're formulating the school district budget, we're going to the town and we want to get as much money as possible from the town, you know, to fund our schools, obviously. But they only have so much money available. So we have to work within a certain pool of money, right? So I'm assuming the state government, federal government, everyone has only so much money. So I'm just, yeah, again, all for it if we can get it. But I'm just wondering where it's coming from. Respectfully, I think that's for the legislature to worry about. And what I oh, mean yeah, is, it's got to come from... <laughs> well, in, the, I, in the sense, I guess what I'm saying is if they look at this and say, look, we'd love to do X, but because of what we anticipate for state revenues, we're only going to be able to do X minus, or maybe it becomes a long-term plan to right. you know, retool the formula on a regular basis, who knows? Um, the question really is, you know, are schools being funded adequately on the state level based on the foundation budget? The resolution is a way of, hey, we think they're not. Please take a look at this. Yeah. And in the end, if they come back and say, hey, here's what we can do, here's what we can't do, that's sort of a different discussion, I think. Okay. Just my opinion. I'm no, I just wanted to, you know, didn't know if I'd missed something along no, the way. I, I think that's, so. I think that's, that's correct. And basically, I mean, we're, and also we're working with a, a, a substantially outdated formula mm -hmm. uh, that hasn't been changed. But for. I will say, education is not alone in that. You know, no, there are but, other, but, you know... But we're not dealing with anything else. But no, I know that's all we are worrying about here, but I'm just <laughs> saying we're not the only, you know, group that is, you know, so, outdated in funding. So. so our job is to deal with yeah. our issue. and to push for it, of course. Um, and anybody, uh, Mary Beth or, or Jeff, anything else? Okay. So what I would say is if you want to come up, provide us with an actual resolution... Sure. Then we'll put it on the agenda next month, and I'm quite certain that uh, we'll we'll favorably vote on that and, and and support that at that time. All right. All right. Well, yeah. thank you very much for your okay. time. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Now we can let all the teachers go, go home. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> go home so they're ready to work tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks, Mary, for everything today. Calendars, the calendar. They're free. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Calendars, take a calendar or two. Calendars. Thank you for coming. How are you? Our other um, other two main items are our program of studies. We have a, a yearly schedule, so we have next our Holden Richmond Program of Studies. Um, this is for a first reading, and the superintendent recommends the HRMS Program of Studies for a first reading. So moved. Second. Okay. Do we have any? Do we have anybody that wants to speak on it? Mr. Federico, maybe. Really sure. <laughs> <laughs> you got to highlight um, the highlight the changes for us. Highlight the changes really fast. All right. Uh, as always, we'll update names of new staff, dates, uh, things of that sort. The, there are two main. Uh, updates that we're proposing. The first is to, we took a look at our mathematics intervention courses, and what we'd like to do is rename those to um, exploring mathematics, and what we added, which you folks received with the new descriptions that just more accurately um, talk about what goes on in there. Um, the second main proposal is the inclusion of the new descriptions of the changes in the social studies and history curriculum from the state. Uh, civics will be returning to grade eight, uh, and grade seven will also see um, some changes as well. Uh, so we we have uh, our teachers are beginning, and our curriculum director is is working on those changes, um, so that we're ready to go for the fall of next year. And the last piece is just to uh, capture an updated description of our dare curriculum that's taught annually to our sixth graders. So those are the proposed changes for our program of studies for next year. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, no questions, but just uh, love to see the uh, both of those 
additions to math and, and the social studies. And I think I'd mentioned before, I thought we ought to get ahead of the curve on the new state requirements in terms of civics. So glad to see it in the, in the uh, program book. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All those in favor for first reading, say aye. 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 Okay. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Next, we have our high school program of studies for a first reading. The superintendent recommends the DHS program of studies for a first reading. So moved. Second. Okay. All right. I promise I'll be efficient. I have a PowerPoint, but I'll be efficient. <laughs> uh, so today we're going to just talk, review the pro, uh, program of studies for the high school. Um, again, the overall, the, uh, the purpose of the program of studies, we're making some adjustments to the graduation requirements. We're proposing some new courses and just wanted to highlight some other refinements just for your attention. Um, just to provide some context on the purpose of the program of studies at the high school level, it serves as a real foundation. Um, for our community coupled with a student handbook that provides insight into not only what courses we offer, but also uh, requirements of students beyond the classroom, such as community service, and then uh, what students need to do to graduate from DHS. Um, the first element we wanted to talk about was our graduation requirements. Under the direction of Dr. Colombino, we um, vetted our ideas uh, to various stakeholder groups, including the school council, uh, the faculty, um, our students, the policy subcommittee, and then central office administration. And starting with, and if you can believe it, we're talking about the class of 2023 already. Uh, so our current eighth graders and beyond. Um, so four major um, things that we wanted to uh, bring to your attention. Two of them are a little more cosmetic. We're adding the, the idea of pathways into the elective category to support the creation and, impl and implementation of the innovation pathways. We collapsed the technology and engineering credits to make sure that students have a wide variety of options to satisfy those requirements. We increased the amount of fine arts credits required by 2.5, so for a total of five credits. And we reduced the number of physical education requirements um, by five as well. Additionally, um, you'll see that there's a, it includes computer science. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in the Mass Core are now allowing computer science classes to be counted for math, science, or technology, depending on the needs of the student, which I think provides this great flexibility in meeting the student's needs and kind of figuring out uh, if they're more interested in the computer science piece, the tech ed piece um, allows them to pursue that. Um, and again, these uh, changes in credits allow more flexibility for our students to kind of pursue what they're passionate about. Uh, when we're talking about proposed courses, uh, we wanted to leverage the expertise and interests of our faculty members. They have a wide ranging um, skill set and interests in what they uh, pursue. We also wanted to identify what student interests were and what their career aspirations <coughs> were. And obviously in a student body as large as ours, uh, we have a lot of kids who are interested in a lot of different things. So we wanted to create innovative courses that engage them in different ways, um, develop passions, because I think that's a large part of what we do at the high school is to help students figure out what they want to be and who they want to be when they uh, leave us, and then prepare them for their post-secondary experience. So the largest change you'll see is with our eighth grade, our eighth grade, oof, 12th grade electives, ELA electives. Uh, we open the door to our ELA department to really think about what um, 12th grade ELA would look like. And so we allowed them, or they came to us, and we made some shifts and are opening the door to uh, mirror a little bit more what they would see at the college level. Uh, we would still uh, align to the standards uh, that are given to us through the state, but would also um, look at those through specific lenses. And the, the ELA teachers really took it and ran with it. And we have 12 new course offerings um, to, to offer to the students to see what the interest is. Everything from page to stage, where they're looking at drama, um, to literature of change, where you're talking about social activism, uh, to Project Citizen, which is a more policy, um, social service kind of bent. Uh, we're really excited about those opportunities for students to kind of explore ELA through a different lens. Uh, you'll see our wellness electives. Uh, in the last year, only 12, 20 students have taken a health class in their junior and senior year. We wanted to change that. And as you can see, uh, we, although health and PE are two separate credit requirements, we combined the department and we created a wellness department because we really felt that those two disciplines are really connected in creating a, an environment for, for students to be able to make really healthy, healthful uh, choices um, and we also wanted to uh, integrate some of the social emotional learning pieces and uh, attend to the needs of those students who are really interested in the health and allied sciences so some of those opportunities are first responders where they'll do CPR first aid infectious disease those types of things uh, the mindful team which will implement SEL practices um, and connect to some of the work 
that Mary's doing with the ECLC grant, um, as well as in yoga, which is a different kind of uh, physical education that we hope will um, intrigue some of our upperclassmen. Two other uh, categories we want to talk to you about. Uh, we're uh, increasing our advanced placement offerings in science uh, by offering AP environmental science. We had some, several students take this class through the VHS. Um, and it was actually an additional class, so they had a full boat of, of classes, and they took this on top of all of that. So there definitely is an interest there and connects well with what we're already offering. We're also offering some additional Project Lead the Way classes, including human body systems, which we've secured grant funding for last year, and we're going to be able to run this year. In music, uh, Mr. Grover's still here. Uh, he is going to be offering a new course next year called Social, um, Social Media and Film, which allows students to really think about their social media use uh, compared to what they see in film and really kind of integrate some of the social emotional aspects and we're really excited about that and again the connections to the ECLC grant has been great. Some other refinements we wanted to talk to you about so name changes uh, we cross-listed special education courses within their content department so they're not so siloed so students can see their courses within their larger department which we thought was really important. Um, we adjusted the fulfills requirement because we collapsed the technology and engineering together so we made some um, formatting changes there. And then again, some general formatting changes to increase readability. I think that's everything. And again, we just really feel that this uh, lays a strong foundation for our students, uh, leverages the expertise of our staff, and it allows students to kind of engage what they're passionate about. So. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions? Anybody good? I do. Just good. one question. Yeah. Um, I think the new course options are great. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. I think you said 12, you know, uh, in the English department alone. Um, will there be a minimum required in order to make that class move forward, minimum enrollment? I would defer to Dr. Colombino because I haven't been through the scheduling process, so. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have that. No, that's fine. You know who did. That's good. Yeah, Use no, your resources. <laughs> with uh, any course, so the 12th grade electives and any other electives, too. So part of that is um, students sign up. So that's up through February vacation. They go home, they talk with families, they pick their courses they want to take, they meet individually with guidance as well um, to make sure that they're on track for graduation. Uh, and then we take that those numbers um, and work together and figure out, um, we project out. So Amy, myself, and our assistant principals will work together to figure out how many sections of each class will run. Mm -hmm. So right, so there's 12 choices and we figured since we're piloting it, teachers are excited about it. Um, and that was a message to teachers, too, that we're going to offer this as, to students. We can't run, you know, right. 12 different um, English courses for seniors. Um, so we're going to see what students sign up for. Um, it might play out that it ends up being, you know, a large number where it's really spread out, or it might end up being um, two or three. So we'll see um, what students select, and we'll go from or would you consider breaking it down so you offer some of them first semester and others second semester? Yeah, yeah, we could talk about that too. Yep, or like um, some courses in the past that we've offered um, in other districts to every other year, kind of. Uh, um, it wouldn't work so much for twelfth grade English, but in sure. terms of other like upper level electives. And would these be restricted to twelfth grade students um, or just the English? Yes, because they so they have um, a pretty standard curriculum for ninth, tenth, eleventh grade English. Um, Eleven splits a little. Because some most students take um, either college prep or honors English, but then they take um, AP language. Some okay. students take AP language in eleventh grade. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Any anybody else? Anybody good? All right. Uh, all those in favor of first reading, say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, guys. All right. The next item is the uh, continuation of the annual review of the superintendent's contract. Uh, we've already done the evaluation. Now we're actually talking about the contract. Um, does anybody uh, want to uh, make a motion? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I would move that uh, the committee vote to increase the superintendent's salary for fiscal, and this will be an increase from fiscal 18 to fiscal 19 from $181,000 to $186,430. Okay. Do I hear, hear a second? Second. All right. Uh, Eric, do you want to talk about that? Yes. Um, we basically go through the same process every year. And the first step is obviously to evaluate the superintendent's performance, which happened last month. 
<clears throat> and it's very clear that all of us on this board are very satisfied with uh, the job that Lisa does, more than satisfied, um, and appreciate what you're bringing to the district. And in fact, the initiatives and the things that are being presented on a monthly basis, the things that are going on in this district, um, show just how uh, directed this district, district is toward improving teacher quality, performance of students, all of the things that we want to see. So clearly, just based on the comments from last month, we are very satisfied with the job. The second step then is to set the salary. And when we go about that process, we typically look at surrounding districts that are comparable in some sense to us in terms of size, uh, in terms of responsibility, um, geographically close to where we are. And that survey shows basically an, an average FY18 uh, salary of 181710 and an average for fiscal year 19 of 187332 The raise that I am proposing is a 3% raise. It brings the superintendent to slightly below the average of the uh, districts we look at. And when you include the fact that uh, Lisa has now 16 years of experience in this district, which is more than any other superintendent on this list, then we think, at least I think, a 3% raise is uh, extremely warranted. And at the same time, we have to look at the um, the fiscal ability of the town to pay and the Smith School Project and all of those things that the town does to support education. Because arguably, if you're simply looking at numbers, you could say, well, it should be higher. But I think uh, the superintendent understands where we're at from a financial standpoint in trying to strike that balance. Um, but I think 3% uh, is a fair reflection of the esteem in which we hold you and the job that we believe you're doing for us. And that is the reason why I propose uh, that about, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Eric. Uh, other comments? Uh, Dave? All set. Eric? Jeff? Cool. Harry Beth? Um, all set. Okay. Um, and I, I would I would agree with the way that Eric uh, explained this. I think what we've tried to do every year that we've really discussed this is is try to compensate um, Lisa fairly, along with the you know considering the the, the 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 needs and the requirements of the town and the budget as a whole. I think that. Uh, I would, I would think that what Eric proposes does that, but um, if there's no further discussion, then I will <clears throat> take a vote on whether or not uh, uh, we approve Eric's, uh, Eric's motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. I have an additional motion, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I would move that we extend <clears throat> the uh, contract of the superintendent for one year that would take us to June 30th, 2023. 24? 24. Okay. Second. Uh, Eric, discussion? And again, just a reflection on uh, uh, the job we think you're doing, and we want to continue this relationship. We hope that you do too. And uh, so that's my motion, Mr. And, Chair. And I would add that it's been pretty consistent uh, that we uh, uh, have extended. Uh, by a year in most of the, the the past several years that we've we've uh, reviewed this this aspect of the contract any other discussion any other comments all right all those in favor say aye aye, aye. okay thank you very much i appreciate the support and the confidence and look forward to our continued work together thank you all right Hey, two other items. We have our fundraising request. The superintendent recommends the approval of the fundraising events for the DHS boss, I mean boys basketball team and the DHS boys and girls lacrosse teams. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Our um, overnight and out-of-state field trip request. The superintendent recommends the approval of the overnight out-of-state field trip request from DHS Falcon Eyes May 1st through the 5th of 2019 to Walt Disney World, Florida, and our 8th graders June 11th through the 14th, 2019 to Washington, D.C. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Oh, uh, no. Well, <laughs> Go ahead. actually, Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to um, just say how wonderful um, the Washington, D.C. trip is. 
Uh, I chaperoned it. I was lucky enough to do that last year. Um, lucky it, or brave enough? Well, you know, <laughs> I, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, but it was a wonderful trip. Uh, Patrick Hamilton does a wonderful job organizing it with all the chaperones, and the students really get a lot out of it, even though it's such a quick trip and there's so much to see and do. Um, I can't say enough about how wonderful the trip was. So thank you to the middle school for wanting to continue that and Mr. Hamilton for wanting to do it again um, and all the chaperones. I can't do it without everyone, but um, it was a great experience. Hopefully so. we'll be open by then. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> I chaperoned it twice and, and both times it took me like three weeks to recover. <laughs> yeah, right? I, I actually found right, it Right, Mr. Federico? <laughs> uh, I, I will go again this year if you need a chaperone. The key is on the. I'm not available that one. week. Sorry. <laughs> Fly home. No. Fly no. home. The bus ride's the best part. Best thing I ever did. Um, all right. Uh, and are you singing down there, or are you just going for fun and enjoyment? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, unfinished business. Thank you. Policy. The superintendent recommends the approval of the review of sections F and G as per the MASC request for a second reading. So moved. Second. Okay, this is for a second reading. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Our okay. wellness policy, the superintendent recommends the approval of the review for our wellness policy for a second reading. So moved. Second. Again, for a second reading, is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, order of business. Thank you. Under communications, we have our link to our North Shore Education Consortium and our annual report for the 2017-18 school year is now available. You have it electronically and we'll also have a copy in um, the district offices. Okay. Uh, legislation. Eric, anything else? No, I covered the, uh, that, that was the substance of my okay. conversation today. Great. Uh, Deep? Um, our monthly meeting is this Wednesday at 745 at uh, First Ipswich Bank on High Street. Um, also, the Deep Spelling Bee, Holton Richmond Spelling Bee will be taking place on Thursday, February 7th, um, with a snow date of the 14th. Uh, so looking forward to that. And uh, that's it right now. Nervous cares? Um, I just want to highlight that the family workshops are starting up again. So the family workshop series, um, which is going to be held, they're always held in the Gordon Room of the Peabody Institute Library, 6 to 7.30. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 coming up. Um, the next is January 22nd, um, and it is regarding developmental stages. So a lot of good uh, parental information on those. So definitely encourage everybody to go to the Danvers Cares website um, to get those, and I'll Every meeting, I'll just be telling you the next one. So January 22nd and then February 6th is one right after that because I think our meeting is following that. So that's observing your child's behavior, which will also be very, very good. Okay, sure. great, thanks. Um, I don't have any uh, update on CPAC. Is, is there anything coming up that we know about? Okay. Okay, great. Uh, policy, I don't think we have anything new on policy no, this month. No, we're going to wait till the next month. Thank you. All right, and then um, the Diversity or Human Rights and Inclusion Committee, we've already uh -huh. heard from Paul Pollock. Is there anything else that we want to talk about tonight? No, I, would, I definitely encourage people to go to this. It's okay. excellent. Okay, great. Uh, minutes. I move to approve and release the minutes from the December 10th, 2018 regular meeting. Second. And I, oh, sorry. <laughs> And I also move and approve the minutes from the December 10th, 2018 executive session meeting not to be released. Second. <laughs> any, any, Eric really wants to mm. go home now. <laughs> well, he wants any, to get to the bachelor. Any, for <laughs> <laughs> any, any, that was good. Any further discussion? <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Like All right. Who gets the rose? <laughs> yeah, who Budget. Doesn't? You have two reports tonight. One is the FY19 mid-year transfer report that primarily reflects some fine-tuning of numbers that we missed as we implemented the budget over the summer, as well as um, transfers to balance grants, as well as um, our last settlement we had with the Administrative Assistance Union um, over the course of the school year. Then you have the December budget Not report. Sure. Happy to report we remain on budget for this year. Okay. Thanks, Keith. Personnel. 
the monthly, thankfully, low volume changes that we have. Um, one point to highlight is the addition of a 0.5 preschool program at the Riverside School starting this month to help address our growing enrollment that we talk about month in and month out and a little preview of one of the items that you will see next month at the budget hearing. Yeah, we love previews. Um, <laughs> Dave? I would, no, we need to know when our next meeting is. Oh, when is our next meeting? <laughs> February 11th. Dave? Now I would like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Good night, Danvers. <laughs>